around the concept of what a confidence interval is. So it's all perfectly clear? Well, in that case, would you describe to me what a confidence interval is? Okay, what's No, that's a tough question. The confidence interval is distinct from a point estimate. An X bar is a point estimate. It's a statistic created from sample. When I calculate an X bar, what am I really interested in? I just do it because I enjoy calculating sample means. What am I interested in? What am I studying? When I calculate an X bar. Yeah, one of the words is good. Let's keep population. Thank you. Excellent. That's exactly what we're studying. We want to know more about the population mean. So we take a sample and calculate a sample mean. And we said the problem with sample means is that they don't tell me the whole story. I don't know how confident I can be in the accuracy of a sample mean. And there are two things that can influence how confident I am in a sample mean. That is, one is, what's one of them? You'd be more confident in a sample mean if what was larger? The sample size. The sample size. Makes sense. Larger sample size, I would be more confident in the sample mean. Problems? And also with a lower standard deviation. Excellent. Lower standard deviation. And we use those two concepts to come up with this idea of a confidence interval to replace my point estimate with an interval. <coughs> I'm going to start right at, at this point. Unfortunately, I can't run the job app on this computer. You can do it back on yours security settings won't allow me. But here's the hard thing to get your mind around with a confidence interval. A confidence interval is based on a sample statistic. So if each one of you were to take a sample and calculate an X bar and a different sample, you'd each get a different value for X bar, wouldn't you? If I said go out and sample 10 cadets, you, you go pick them at random you would have 10 different X bars for measuring, say, the height. You would have 10 different confidence intervals for the height of a, the mean height of a cadet corps. You'd have 10 different ones, right? The confidence interval depends on your sample. So this, this uh, Java applet, which is really a, a nice way to describe what is happening in this I can get fancy here. Yeah, that red line that I'm attempting to draw in my shaky hand, let's suppose we knew the true mean was 50. Behind this applet is a, is a simulation from a population that really does have a mean of 50. But we're sampling from it, and each time we do the sample, we're doing, we're calculating two confidence intervals, and those are the, what these horizontal lines represent. And the red lines are, no, the, I guess that would be orange. Orange are a 95% confidence interval. And the blue to blue is a 99% confidence interval. If it's a 99% confidence interval, that means, on average, 99 times out of 100, the true population mean will be somewhere in that interval. And they're just demonstrating here. They did a simulation. A hundred times they calculated a confidence interval based on random samples. They calculated 99% confidence intervals. And guess what? Exactly 99 of them actually did contain the mean. But you're not going to do that every time. But if you looked here, can we see the one that did not? Yeah, that's right. It's this one right here. That confidence interval missed everything. 
but that's what's going to happen. Your confidence level is basically telling you how often you're going to be right or wrong. Who just joined us? Yes, sir. Uh, your name? Clark. You are here. Okay. Sir. Did you add recently? Uh, I had it last week, but I was in the hospital last week. I was sick for the whole week. Oh, man. And, uh, so it's my first time actually here. Sorry, I'm waiting. I forgot to ask the class, actually. All right. Well, I guess I won't have you make up the quiz today, but we ought to talk after class. Yes, sir, absolutely. Get you started. I saw the name of Angel. I haven't seen anybody named Mark in here. So, okay. All right, now I'm going to go through once more and break down the pieces of a confidence interval and have you need to get familiar with, with their names and how they're calculated. And then we're going to do lots of problems, right? I'm, this time through the course, I'm taking a lot of time. I'm front end loading this chapter. <clears throat> get a hold of the concepts now, and then afterwards, doing the problems is going to be easy. Really well. Challenges to get your head around the first few days of the lecture. All right, confidence interval. Let's start giving things names. The confidence level, and I usually abbreviate that, abbreviate that with a CL, and it's often expressed as a percentage. That's the probability in the middle. One way to talk about it. And in that graph that I drew, it's the kind of gray area in the middle. Confidence level, you can think of it this way. This is the number of times I want to be correct, meaning that's the percent of times that my confidence interval will actually contain the true parameter value. And you recall someone on Friday said, well, why don't you just make, make it really high? And we're going to see there's a trade off. As you make your confidence level larger, the width of the interval gets wider. So there's really not a whole lot you're gaining there. So when you start one of these problems, you need to have a confidence level. You as a statistician will get to pick it. And any problem I give you, I'll say use 95%, 99%. The three numbers that are commonly used are 90, 95, and 99. But you know, there's no mathematical theorem that says it has to be 95%. 95% confidence level means you're going to be wrong roughly one time in 25% of the time. Once I have a confidence level, that's the area in the middle, then I know the area in the tails. We call that alpha. That's the significance level. You're going to hear a lot about significance levels for the rest of this course. Alpha will always represent the significance level. <clears throat> so if I put 95% uh, in the middle, I have 5% left. I split it in half and put half of it there half of it there. So alpha is the total area in both tails. Alpha over 2 is what I put in each tail. And this value here, you'll see it written as z sub alpha slash 2, alpha divided by 2. That's the critical value. Remember, these are z values, and a z value is from a standard normal distribution. When I did the derivation of our first confidence interval, I ended up with an expression like this. Remember, I got the 1.96? Well, how did I get the 1.96? I assumed a 95% confidence level. Alpha was equal to 0 0.05, and alpha over 2 was 0 0.025. And if you do your inverse norm function, if you've got your calculators now, just for a little practice, do some aerobic exercise after lunch. Make sure that I did it correctly. What number are you going to put in for inverse norm? Thomas? 0 0.02. 0 0.02. Mm -hmm. 0.05. No. Good thing we're doing this. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05. 0.05
No. Alpha is 0.05. See that alpha over 2 there? So if alpha is 0.05, alpha over 2 is 0.025. That is the area in each tail. So to find this critical value, it has 0.025 area to the right. It's got 0.975 to the left. So what's the inverse norm 0.975? Point 0.025. 1.96 is this critical value. Do I need to go through that one more time, feeling? I have a question. For the sure. alpha over 2, is that, that's supposed to be 0.025, right? Not 0.02? Or is that supposed to be 0.02? Yeah, I, I ran out of space uh, on my monitor. Uh, oh, that's why you did 0.02? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's my lack of penmanship in my. I can't write small. 0.025. Okay, let's push it ahead then. So breaking this down again, the parts of a confidence interval. A confidence interval always starts with a point estimate. We're going to be doing four different flavors of confidence intervals. They will all start with a point estimate. Right now we're studying means or mu's. So the point estimate we start with is a x bar. We start with our point estimate, and then we adjust it to the right and to the left. And that's how much I adjust it by. So in the context of the problem, you should be able to find every one of these numbers. x bar you will, will be calculated. You'll be told what that is. The z alpha over 2 comes, well, your confidence level is going to lead you to how to find that Z alpha over 2, right? If you have a confidence level, you know what the alpha is, so you know what alpha over 2 is, so you do the inverse norm and you can get that. And then what are the other components of it? Well, sigma and the square root of n. Recall for the time being, this is just for the time being, we're assuming we know sigma, the true population mean. We're going to change that. Thank you change that in a bit, but for now we have no signal. So to make things a little bit neater, we're going to simplify this, and a lot of times you'll see me write E, we'll call it the margin of error, and E is that Z sub alpha over 2 sigma with square root of n. And then I would write my confidence interval as X bar plus or minus E. Point estimate is smack dab in the middle of your confidence interval. You go e to the right, e to the left. So the total width of your confidence interval is two times e. All right, there's a lot going on there. I understand. Let's get at and actually calculate some of these. Uh, hopefully that will make it easier. First of all become very comfortable finding what we call these critical values. So at a 90% confidence level, alpha is <coughs> 0.1. On your, on your calculators right now, calculate Z sub, what would I be looking for? Z sub what? Confidence level is equal to 90%. Alpha is 1 minus the confidence level, so that's 0.1. Alpha over 2 is 0.05. So I'm looking for Z sub 0.05. And that is the Z value that has 0.05 probability to the right. Follow those steps. And that number is? I did not follow that. Did not? All right. Let's do it once more with feeling here. It's important. The, the, the A and the divided by 2, I'm, I'm not sure where that comes from. I get the Z's the Z is like the, the point 0.9. The, the, the point. Yeah, point 0.9. 9%. Well, the 
confidence level is 90%. That's, that's the CL. That's what it starts with. From that, you define your alpha. Alpha is what's left. Well, 1 minus 0 0.9 is 0 0.1. Alpha is the total area of the tails, the two tails. And I divide it evenly. So the area in the rightmost tail will be alpha over 2, or 0.05. And where does it come from? Well, I've got 0.05 probability in this tail. What z value is the oh, 0.05 norm. probability to the right? It's an inverse norm. It's an inverse norm. Inverse norm 0.95. Right, you're so we'll do that. Inverse norm 0.95, and what do you get? 0.645. How about that one? 0.645. I got it right. Let's do one more. Suppose it's 0.99% confidence level. 1 minus the CL is 0.01. That's alpha is 0.01. Alpha over 2 is 0 0.005. So that means now I'm looking for a Z value that has 0 0.005 probability to the right. The inverse norm 0.995, and that's going to give me what? How many got? 2.5. Dot, dot, dot. All right? Yeah. Okay. We good to go on this? back to our example of the NFL lineman, and we're going to calculate two more confidence intervals. So I'd like you to do this on some scratch paper or notebook as we go along. It's more practice. In this example, here's all the important piece of information. We know that N is 5, sigma is 15, and X bar is 296.5. That's my point estimate. We've already calculated the 95% confidence interval. Now let's go calculate the 90 and a 99% confidence interval. And I want you to do it, then we'll just check it. Keep in mind, here's, here's the formula. It's x bar plus e is the right, well, it's x bar minus e is the left point, and x bar plus e right point, and E is equal to C sub alpha over 2, sigma over square root of n. So let's do it step by step. In this first problem, the confidence level is 90%, alpha is 0.1. Alpha over 2, z sub alpha over 2 is 1.645. You have these numbers memorized eventually. So what's E equal to? Get out your calculators. Find E for me. When you multiply that by the standard deviation over. Mm -hmm. over just substitute in here. Over n. Z sub alpha over 2 is 1.645. Sigma is uh, 15. And n is 5. Good. And this is my E, my margin of error. It's just another name for this expression. Okay, sign that. 11.035. 11.035. Anybody get that? Anybody not get that? Yeah. So um, just not quite sure. Okay, okay. where did I, where did I lose? Um, the whole the whole thing about like when you start out with the x bar minus e and that stuff. So you you find e first. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> I know we introduced some extra names for things, haven't we? It just makes the notation a bit 
simpler later on, but a little more complicated right now. Just keep in mind, everything starts out with a point estimate. Okay, right now it's an X bar because we're interested in means. Then I've got to find my margin of error. Well, I have a formula for that. And everything in this formula will be straightforward, except I'll have to do a little bit of work to get my critical value. To get the critical value, I have to know the confidence level. Work from there. Well, now that I have the 11.03, my 90% my confidence level would equal uh, 296.5 minus 11.035 and it would go to 296.5 plus 11.035. And if I was to write an English sentence that described that, I would say, I am 90% confident that the true mean of NFL linemen, I'm 95% confident that the interval of from 296.5 to, I'm sorry, I haven't done these numbers yet. What are they equal to? 285 285.46. Yeah, so that's about 285 to 308. So my last sentence would be, I'm 90% confident that the true mean of NL, NFL linemen is in the interval between 285 and 308 pounds. Yeah? How do you want us to round for those numbers? If it's above 0.5? We round up the next whole number? Yeah, it, as a general, three decimal places. I mean, like, like I got 307, and that's just because, is that for the rounding? Like how I, I'm sure. Yeah. So, okay. I'm, not, I'm not real fussy about that. If I see your work, I'm not likely that I'm going to deduct any points for rounding unless it's really egregious. Okay. All right, let's do one more. Go back now, and I want you to do this solo. All of you should be doing it. Eyes closed there. You with us? All right, rallying. Now do a 99% confidence interval. You've got all the information you need to tell how to do it. Start working on it. If you have a question, raise your hand, I'll come help you, or ask a, a colleague. Got an answer. Who can take me through it here? All right, then Sam. How do we start these problems? Um, well, B equals it'd be two point uh, two point five seven five. Um, 
I got something like that. go through this first step and make sure I didn't lose anyone there. That's Z sub alpha over 2. The way I ask you to start all these problems is that it all starts with the confidence level. So it's 99%. Then what's the next thing I calculate? Well, my alpha. That's 1 minus 0.99. So that's 0.01. But I really need alpha over 2, so that's 0 0.005. So when my formula becomes E, the margin of error, is Z sub 0 0.005 sigma over the square root of n. And now it's plug and chug. I get this number using inverse norm. And these numbers are given to me. Okay? Yes? For the uh, confidence interval, mm -hmm. do you want uh, us to run the whole numbers? Uh, I did in this case just, I don't want your eyes worried about decimal points at this time. I want you to focus on the big picture, all right, instead of chasing around decimal points. Uh, and I guess it would matter on the subject, too. We're talking about weights of human beings. We don't need numbers to four decimal places. So. But I said, to completely answer your question, as a general rule, three decimal places. All right. Someone give me a sentence, then, that describes this result. Because just as a forewarning, you will see we didn't talk about the quiz. But you'll see that I'm, I'm pretty particular about how you answer questions. You might see red in places you think, well, what did I do wrong? On confidence intervals, I will always expect three pieces to get full credit, three things. They are, you've got to tell me what the interval is. But you'll see we can get that out and calculate real fast. Then I'll want to see an inequality so that I, that I understand, that I know that you understand what it is we're studying. So this is saying 279 is less than or equal to mu is less than or equal to 314. That's the inequality. I'm studying a mean, and that's my confidence interval for the mean. But the last thing I'll have you do, for anything that's graded, is write a sentence. And the sentence would be, well, someone take a shot at it here. What would the sentence be? Go for um, it. I'm 99% confident that the mean weight of football players is between 2.79 and 315. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with that. I might change it just a little bit. That's, the author makes a couple proposals. Uh, I think he suggests that I'm 99% confident that the true mean weight of NFL linemen You would say, I'm 99% confident that the interval 279 pounds to 314 pounds contains the true mean weight of NFL linemen. Yeah, I know, that's really picky to see a distinction between here, but I'm not going to. If you get that close to it, I'll be very happy. 99% right. confident that the mean is in that interval, which means if I calculate that confidence interval 100 times, 99 out of 100, on average, I will be correct. The mean will be in there someplace. OK. Uh, marching ahead, then, we've calculated three confidence intervals already for means. Look at the width of these. That's 90, 95, 99. What happened to the width as my confidence level went from 90 all the way up to 99? got bigger, didn't it? Yeah. That's the part that might be counterintuitive at first, but again, think about it, of, of the role that I want to be correct 99% of the time. So is my interval going to be narrower or wider? Yeah, maybe wider. If 
if you only require me to be right 90% of the time, I can make it narrower. And it all comes from, if you look at this formula, what makes the margin of error larger? The overall width of the interval is two times the margin of error, isn't it? Because I start to go e to the left and e to the right. So what makes e bigger? Well, my critical value. And what makes my critical value bigger? Well, that's a 90% critical value, that's a 95%, that's a 99%. That's why the confidence level increasing increases the width of the confidence. Confidence level increasing increases the width of the confidence interval. All right. So just said. All right. Let's have you do one in class here. We've got some time to do this. I claim the IQ of my math students, the mean IQ is 115. I took a random sample and I calculated a 95% confidence interval. And it was 105 to, 105 to 116. So, Don't, don't be too far ahead here. I have a 95% confidence interval for the mean IQ of the cadets in my class, and it's 105 to 116. Does that support my claim that IQ, the mean IQ of my cadets is 115. Could I use that as statistical evidence? I can see heads going, why? Yeah, but 115 is way out here on the right. Well, let me talk you out of it. It's still in the confidence interval. You know, we don't, we're saying that 95% of the time when I do this, I'll have the true mean will be somewhere in that interval. I don't know. It might be all the way to the left, all the way to the right. It could be smacked out in the middle. I don't know, but I'm just saying that 95% of the time, somewhere in that interval will be the true mean. So even though 115 is toward the right-hand side of it, it's in the interval. So that data would support that claim. We'll be using confidence intervals throughout to, to test claims. Do we have reason to believe that this is really true? All right, here's an example for you to start. That's the information. I want you to first of all find the best point estimate of the mean weight population of all men, and then I want you to construct a 95% confidence interval. Let's just take the first two questions at once. Now there's a, a set of steps I want you to go through when you work with these problems. Let's see if I got it. I need to move that. All right, I apologize. Back to that. For the rest of this course, when you have a problem like this, the first thing I want you to do is identify what parameter are you working with. What parameter are we studying in this problem? We've got three choices. A mean. We're studying a mean. It can either be a mu, a p, or a sigma. A mean, a proportion, or standard deviation. Just make sure before you start a problem, you know what you're studying. We are studying the parameter is equal to mu, and that's the mean what? Mean weight of males. Alright, the 
the second thing I want you to always do, now that I have the, pump, the parameter, check the requirements. All these techniques that we have uh, can be used, but only if I satisfy the requirements. Does this situation satisfy the requirements? Maybe you should ask or refresh your mind. What, if, what are the requirements? One of two things has to be true. Remember these? Anybody? Excellent. In this case, what do we need it? What would have the, to be? Uh, the weights. Excellent. The weights of a male would have to be normally distributed. So my random variable x is equal to the weight of one male. Now, if that's normally distributed, then I don't have to worry about the sample size. And that's, it would be fair to assume that weights are normally distributed. But I've got another get out of jail card here. What is it? Even if someone challenged me and said, no, I don't believe that. Weights aren't normally distributed. And is less than 30. Or our n is greater than 30. Yeah. N is greater than, n is equal to 40 here. So we're good to go. We satisfy the requirements. All right. The next step then, in these problems, there's always a bunch of numbers. The next thing I want you to do is give each of those numbers its proper name, its proper symbol. I probably did one already. N is equal to 40. There's another number over there, uh, 26. What is it? It's a symbol. That's it. What standard deviation? Same population. Population. Three letters of population. Well, the two requirements, is this normally distributed to the same cell to be at greater than 30? No. If it's, if it's normally distributed, sample size doesn't matter. If it's not normally distributed, then n has to be greater than 30. So I've covered here. I've covered. Same as 26. Uh, n is 40. What other number do I have there, and what number do I want to give it? Uh, is that Taylor? At 172.55. Yeah, that's the sample mean. Okay. And what is 21? That's a case okay, so we don't need that number. All right, good. You've gone through the first two steps. Now the question is, what's the best point estimate of the mean weight of the population of all men? What is that number? Stand by. Yeah. A point estimate would be an X bar. Now, you'll see in your um, <coughs> lab in the book, the author usually uses the phrase, the best point estimate. All right, well, here's what he's saying. X bar is an unbiased estimate. That means it's a good one. It's pretty resilient. So this best point estimate is a little bit of fluff, but it is, in most populations, it provides the most reliable estimate of the population. You can always come up with pathological examples where it fails, but that's what, for our kind of informal purposes, we'll say the best point estimate of a mean population mean is x bar. All right, I want to construct a 95% confidence interval. What's the next thing I need to do? Galvez? Let me help you get started. You know, you know the answer to this question. You might not know you know the answer. What's the confidence level? 95. 95%. So as soon as I calculate the confidence level, what's the next thing I would calculate? The confidence. Alpha? Yeah. And that, it's going to be 
0.05. Alpha over 2 will be 0 0.025. And now what am I really getting at? What do I really want to know? I want to know yeah, so C sub 0 0.025, which is inverse norm. And that is equal to six. Do everything in a sequence and it's really straightforward. Now what's the, the last thing I want to go over here? Now I'm ready to actually calculate my margin of error, E. And the formula, it's Z sub alpha over 2, sigma over the square root of N. All right, we've got all these numbers. You do the calculations. You plug in, check, and tell me what E is. Nick Koza, head of the game here. What do you got? Uh, 8.05. 8.05? 8.16? And what units are we talking about? It must be pounds. Right? Make sure you, you do it too now. Make sure you get the same answer. You got that? Alright. Then what's my confidence interval? It's yeah, it's x bar minus e, comma, x bar plus e. And I will get roughly 164 and Done now? Would you hand that in the test? No, you still have no. some points. You, oh, you lose about two thirds of points. <coughs> the next step is to write the inequality. It will be like 164.49 is less than or equal to x bar. Nope. Uh, that would get spreading. Greater than or equal to g of oh, u. u. Yes. What are you studying? Yeah, I'm not studying x bar. X bar is given to me. I know what x bar is. I don't know what mu is. It also is less than or equal to 180 points. Yep, so this point right here. And now, oh yes, question. Yeah, on the test or quizzes, are you going to say if you want a statement or are we just going to have to put out what time You will know that, that you always do that for me. No exceptions. If I ask for confidence interval, then I'm looking for three pieces of information. That's just the way we roll here. All right. All right. Then the statement is, this is, if you're an anchor person, you would explain it as follows. I'm 95% confident that the mean weight of men is between 164.49 and 1.18.61 pounds. Oh, we had one other question. Previous estimate was, okay. In 1960, we had an estimate of 166.3 pounds as the mean weight of all men. Is that still valid? Do we have any reason not to believe that that's still the mean weight of males? Yes. What was it? 160. 166.3. So, do I have any reason to say, wait, yeah. that's wrong? No. We have no reason. Because it's still in the total the end. Okay. Well done. Did you catch up? 166 is still in this interval. Now don't get worried about, oh, it's on the left side or any of that business. It's in the interval. So I have no reason to believe that that's not the true value. It's 
It's just as good as any other number. All right, I'm going to introduce, in the waiting minutes here, one other concept, and then by Wednesday and Friday, we'll be ready to really crack out a lot of these. Okay. There's one other important question that we haven't asked yet. We know that the sample size can, does affect the margin of error, right? The larger the sample size, the smaller the margin of error. So isn't it reasonable to ask then, well, if I want a margin of error no more than, say, 10 pounds, if I'm studying weights of men, how big does my sample size have to be? The sample size is one thing you can control. Right? You can, if you've got the time and the money, you can always get larger samples so you can make your margin of error smaller. So it's an interesting question to ask, well, how big <coughs> do I have to make my sample? And we've got a formula for that. It's on your formula sheet. And it's really easy to get. That's the formula for the margin of error. We're all familiar with that now. Just lose, use a little bit of algebra to solve for n. And you get n is equal to that. Those formulas are on your formula sheet. You don't have to memorize them, but you have to understand what they mean. So in this case, that's the minimum sample size I need to be, and I have to be careful here, the alpha over 2 is going to give me my confidence level. So I might say I need a sample size 100, 95% confident the margin of error is no greater than 5 pounds. Okay. All that together. All that together. All right. We'll start right here at once.